Hi everyone, this is Iyad Murtada and on behalf of Open Thinking and Sherm, uh, Mia, I, I would like to welcome you here for our second webinar related to standards in HR. Today we have with us the Executive Director of Sharm uh, in uh, UAE and uh, he's going to be speaking about the standards in HR, which is the second section of uh, a webinar of three uh, sections. Uh, at the same time, uh, this webinar is going to be like about for 50, 50 minutes. If you have any question, you can leave it uh, until the end. This, uh, uh, this presentation, is, like I said, is going to be really interesting because it's gonna, he's going to highlight you know, what are the issues related to the standards. The first one, he was focusing exactly why do we have the HR standards, why the standards in HR are important, and he was comparing this with the standards in accounting or in other professions. And after that, in this section, he's going to go more in depth into uh, other issues. Welcome, Mr. Brad. Yes, thank you very much, Yad, and thank you, as always, for your support. I want to thank everyone who's online uh, following this webinar. I want to also thank you for your feedback. Uh, there was quite a bit of feedback from the first session, so that's very reinforcing. Uh, I'm certain that you'll find this one equally, if not more interesting. Uh, the aspect here that is um, the focus is the title I call is Diversity Imperative. And the reason this webinar came about related to the very nationalistic sentiment that relates to this topic. People can get very protective, very uh, biased in terms of their understanding in terms of HR standards from a national point of view. So what I really want to do with this webinar is try and put as many issues on the table for people to think about, maybe perhaps address some of these issues. Uh, but part of the reason is simply to tell people that people doing this project are aware of the vast majority of issues that you're thinking of. Uh, so let's start and walk through the webinar. As I mentioned, this is part two of a three-part series. Part one is already on record. This is part two, the diversity imperative. And part three, which we will do within the next week, will be a walkthrough of the HR standard for performance management from ANSI. Uh, I'm going to move fairly quickly through these first slides. Uh, again, it's available on the first webinar. Part of the reason why these webinar series came about, uh, what this webinar is not about. Uh, a bit of a disclaimer, as I mentioned, all that follows is one person's opinion, my opinion, related to my involvement with this project. There are hundreds of people, uh, soon to be thousands of people, working on this project around the world. And I really do not want to suggest for a minute that I'm speaking for anyone other than myself. Uh, full disclosure, I am a Sherm business partner as well. And the purpose of this series is to simply advance the discussion on the topic of standards in HR. The starting point for this webinar, this is a quote from a few years ago, and it reads, don't assume something is an American behavior simply because it happened in America first. The person who is quoted here is Kenichi Omai. He's a Japanese management guru. Some of you may know of him. He worked for McKinsey for quite a few years, and he's written several books. He is really one of the, the very well-known uh, proponents of globalization. And this quote actually came from a book that was in Japanese. The English title for it is called, Having Seen the World, I Can Now See Japan Better. And this quote comes from 1989. The context back in 1989 was in the 1980s, Japan was struggling to understand its place in the world as the first non-Western industrial nation. In such uncharted circumstances, people often try and define what they are by contrasting what they are not. Omai's point to his fellow Japanese citizen was that Human beings act certain ways based upon their per capita disposable income level crossing certain thresholds. And the magic number at the time was 10,000 uh, US dollars per capita. And his point was, this has nothing to do with nationality, race, or any other, as he would say, discriminating factor. Very concisely, Omaya was saying that people are people. And recognizing this fact is part personal experience, and part personal choice was the message he was giving to his citizens. Again, this is from 1989. So I want to ask all of you following this webinar now a question. Is global diversity an oxymoron? 
And I do want you to think through the question for a moment. Is global diversity an oxymoron? Because part of the reason I ask is globalization is frequently characterized as standardization. The words are often used interchangeably. Plus, the trade-off between standardization and localization, also known as customization, is one of the definitional pillars and dichotomies of international and global HR. When you study the theory of global and international HR, this is often the starting point, the trade-off that exists between standardization and localization. But is global diversity an oxymoron? Or are we actually creating many elements of this contradiction through our own personal interpretation of what is or is not global? Again, think about it. Is global diversity an oxymoron? In a philosophical sense, I don't really want to spend too much time in these softer areas, but for example, did a contradiction really exist in the first place once it's been resolved? That's one of those age-old philosophical questions that gets you thinking about your own methods of understanding and thinking itself. In terms of HR, in terms of global HR, the only way for us to find out what is or is not a universal HR standard is to have the discussion. We might just discover that there are some contradictions in global HR that don't really exist. A bit of history about standards in general. Um, and this is going back, let's say, just over 100 years. I've started with a bit of a header, a bit of a chart that talks about the value chain. You take a value chain, you add a new standard to that, and it will change the environment. And in the subcontext, in terms of the value chain, is the value chain is a cause and effect relationship in business. You add to that a new standard, which is, uh, to use the informal, a killer application and you really change the environment. There is a paradigm shift. What are some examples of that historically? Probably the most well-known one is the assembly line. The assembly line and interchangeable parts. So if the assembly line is the value chain and interchangeable parts, that is where you have, think of the assembly line in the car manufacturing where you can put one tire on and another tire on or another screw on and they all interchange. That was just as much of one of the important developments in industrialization as the assembly line itself. People often think about what did the assembly line create and interchange it. They think of cars. But the broader context was it fundamentally changed human living and created suburbs. Prior to that, suburbs were impossible because of the need to travel and the affordability of travel. That was a huge change that rippled through society around the world. The internet, another fundamental uh, change element in terms of the value chain and the cause and effect, the standard that allowed the internet to proliferate has been open source code. Coding, coding um, computer programming is the source, but the idea of having computer programming that fit with other computer programming in terms of open source created social media and we all know that is a huge topic today all of these can trace an element of their leverage and their history to the idea of standards hospitality and retail how does that fit into this mix well the reality is is that both of these industries are the experts at standardizing learning and development process they take uh, a raw material that is a human being and they bring people into their workplace environments and they create brand ambassadors. And from the point of development, that is actually the most sophisticated application of learning and development and standardizations that exists. And the outcome, the paradigm shift, is a brand experience. When you talk to retailers and hospitality, and there's other industries that do it as well, but retail and hospitality are the core and the ones that are most successful. Think of Starbucks. The Starbucks is selling an experience. And at the core of that experience has been the ability to, for Starbucks to create a value chain that leverages standards 
to create brand ambassadors that deliver that brand experience all over the world. Another technical example would be something like iTunes and Apple products. Steve Jobs was world famous for introducing that he's not selling technology, he's creating experiences for the user. And coming back to my earlier quote from Kenichi Omai, think about it. Starbucks, Apple, these, con these, these organizations started in the United States. But when more than 50% of your users, when more than 50% of your customers are having an experience outside of the United States, is it an American experience? A bit of food for thought. Retail and hospitality actually represent the most abstract evolution of the tangible to less tangible migration of interchangeable parts. The HR standards project itself is designed to codify and if successful has the potential to extend the lessons already learned from successful retail and hospitality in the realm of other industries that people never really thought of HR more than an administrator. And that is the market that has potential to open up that currently doesn't exist because of something like the ISO standards project. What can industries like retail and hospitality demonstrate to under other industries about HR is, if the outcome of the value chain is an experience, you can create a learning and development in an HR system that can scale exponentially. Again, think of Starbucks, think of Apple. But to do this, you must have standards. These organizations, maybe they've created their own internal standards. But at the core, the learning and development process has internal standards designed to facilitate an end user experience. And in this broader context, in terms of scaling, Global diversity is an imperative. It is a profound strength. If you want to leverage your value chain and your user experience, you need as much global diversity as possible to be successful in implementing your strategy. Here's another fairly famous uh, historical person, Sam Walton. He's the founder of Walmart. When he wrote his autobiography, he listed at the end of the book his 10 lessons learned from his experience in developing Walmart. And one of those lessons that he quoted was, never jump and backfill. And what that means, maybe it's quite obvious to you or not, but the idea is that in terms of implementing, in terms of having a strategy and being successful, don't overextend yourself. Do not go too far into your planning and not having sort of a backup plan. Think of it as sort of jumping over a, 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 a valley and if you don't have a bridge or some way to get back to where you started from, you've actually created more problems than you had originally. So how does that fit into this discussion? Well, for better or worse, the first cycle that we're in right now of developing HR standards, we can't follow the wisdom of Sam Walton in this, in this process. And there's a very important appreciation as to why we cannot. Because the first cycle of what we're doing necessarily requires a lot more time and energy be put into fixing the neglect of the past and bringing it into the present and cleaning it up. That is what backfill is all about. In a sense, we've already jumped ahead without having standards. Therefore, what this is saying is that in terms of developing our standards project now, we really do need to spend more effort cleaning up the past rather than sort of setting the ideals of where we want to go next. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves. However, the idea of cleaning up the past or jumping ahead into the future has significant resistance points around the world. And it's very specific to whether or not you're living and working in a developed or emerging market. Specific to the HR Standards Project, the problem is that this is a twofold agenda. If you think about it, the idea of backfilling HR, that without doubt frustrates the agenda of many developed nations who cannot understand why any time or energy is being applied to such basic fundamentals. If you're living and working in a developed economy and all of a sudden you're talking about incredibly basic elements of HR, you're frustrated. On the other hand, 
The idea of jumping almost blind faith into global HR as a developing or emerging market, that's incredibly intimidating if you think about it because developed markets have had years, if not decades, to develop their HR systems, their legal processes, their cultural and workplace norms. As an emerging market, if you're asked to sit at the table with these developed markets and discuss HR, it can be very intimidating. Yet both sides in this type of project actually need each other in an extremely profound way. I'm sure we've all heard this expression, no, we, we, we don't know what we don't know. This is one of the most powerful tools that we all should apply in this project. In terms of creating universal or global standards for HR, we need to know what will not work just as much as striving to expose what will work. In terms of standards, assumptions are like prejudices. And in, in attempting to address and find out the truly effective standards, these assumptions are like blind spots. And we need to get rid of these blind spots in order to create standards that can appeal to as many stakeholders as possible. In terms of standards, the rule that you cannot make all of the people, people happy all of the time, this most certainly applies. Uh, one of the things that will come up in the third webinar of this series is that in the terms of the developing standards, you're not reaching a universal uh, uh, consensus. It is a consensus of the participants, but it's, it's acknowledged to be a process that's very unlikely to have unanimity, as they say. So herein is part of the challenge, is that the first attempt in this type of cycle involves a jump and a backfill at the same time. And this goes against more prudent strategic planning and the advice of people as successful as Sam Walton, who, who built the largest retail empire uh, to date. So coming back to the webinar format that we're going to go through today, what we've gone through so far is basically the introduction. In terms of dealing with some of the issues that relate to nationalism and HR standards, uh, I've organized the webinar in a format that sets out four sets of contrary opinions in sort of a point-counterpoint format. The first one will be the five most common reasons that people say, well, I should do nothing. And then there'll be the five most common misconceptions about this project, then the five least valid concerns followed by the five most valid concerns. So there's the four groups here, 20 point counterpoints, followed by a set of the benefits, the five main benefits to this project. What I'll be doing too is using a countdown format. So for the first one, when I have the five most common reasons to do nothing, I'll start with number five, four, three, two, one where number one repre represents the most common reason to do nothing. Where possible, I may add some anecdotes from personal experience or even recommendations based on either being involved in this project or uh, advice or experience that has come to my intention uh, through this project. This second of three webinars will contain some of the more conscientious uh, or contentious, sorry, elements of this topic. Uh, it's not meant to be confrontational. The main reason is to get ideas on the table for discussion. We want to have absolute transparency as it relates to this project. There's no reason for anything not to be discussed. One of the things that we found is people who are not actively participating in this type of project, sometimes they feel that certain issues are not being addressed. Well, if you're not participating, you're not going to know whether or not they're going to be addressed. Part of the reason of putting this webinar together is to have these topics, in a sense, reassure, you may not like the outcome or the answer, but reassure that once you get together a, a large number of people, like those who are participating in this project, almost every conceivable topic gets discussed at some point or another. In the end, the goal of this webinar, number two, is the same as number one and part three and that is to advance the discussion. So here we go with the first group. The top five reasons that we hear people say, I'm not doing anything related to this project. And I'm going to list them in order before I go them into detail. Number five, 
Where's the demand for HR standards? Number four, competencies are the new standards. Number three, HR is inherently national. Number two, if ISO is voluntary, I volunteer to ignore. And number one, not participating is a vote against the project. So these are the top five reasons that we've heard people say why they're doing nothing. So let's go through them one by one, point to counterpoint. Starting with number five. Where is the demand for HR standards? Maybe for some of you already, you have the answer to that. You are the demand. But there's many people out there who are saying, where? Show me. Show me the demand. Well, one place you can point to that demonstrates the demand is the number of people that are actually already participating in this program. As I mentioned at the outset, there are hundreds of people working with SHRM for the development of ANSI standards right now. These people are working without pay, without recognition, and without any sort of certainty as to what the outcome will be. It seems to me that that is a very strong demonstration of demand in the marketplace. How about this one? Internal HR audits. Have any of you gone through an audit before in your capacity as HR and after the fact said that that was an absolutely worthless endeavor? because the audit itself, the benchmarks, were either arbitrary, subjective, or didn't connect with your business. I have. This has happened to me. And so I, that's one of the reasons why I would support this project. I've, ha I've had HR audits done in the past where I was the one teaching the auditor how to do an HR audit and the limitations of the audit because there are no standards. In one of my previous positions, we were actually given uh, KPI targets based on employee turnover, and maybe some of you have that as well. And we were given a corporate benchmark that I had never seen before in my life, a formula for calculating employee turnover that made, not only did it not make sense to me, but I knew how to uh, play games with that formula to make myself look good. And this is an example of where when you have no generally accepted HR standards that someone can just say this is a standard and it becomes one person's word against another person's word. HR standards are not a make work project. What they represent is a cleanup project. So I encourage anyone who wants to assess where is the demand for this HR standards project Instead of asking people that are in your immediate circle of acquaintances or work, ask someone outside of that circle that has a relationship to HR and see what they say about this project, whether or not there's a demand for international standards in HR. So top five reasons to do nothing. Number four, competencies are the new standard. I've heard this a lot. And what this demonstrates to me is a very confusing understanding in the marketplace as to what is the difference between competencies and standards. The best definition that I can give you in a sort of logical sense is competencies are to standards as person, that is supply, is to an organization or job, that is demand. Competencies and standards are two sides of the same coin, but they are not the same coin. Failure to understand the difference between competencies and standards is actually one of the best reasons that we need to be more clear as to what standards are. One of the best ways, I think, for people who have trouble seeing the difference is to do a bit more research on the standards in finance and accounting. Go online. Look at generally accepted accounting principles. Look at international financial reporting standards. I did it myself in Wikipedia, and it shows you very clearly what finance is using as standards and if you compare that to what you know to be as competencies hopefully you'll be able to see a very clear difference top five reasons to do nothing number three hr is inherently national and yet think about this if hr is national and iso standards why are so many governments also by definition national using ISO standards. It also surprises me how many people will say HR is a national function and yet a lot of these people have never worked outside of one country. 
And often those who have worked outside of more than one country will have worked in a very similar country. They may say, oh no, it's very different. But how do you know it's different if you haven't really had a very wide degree of experience in different nationalities and cultures? So what I would say to that is that the best way to really see the extremes of difference is you have to work in, have had work experience in say a developed market and an emerging market. Someone who's worked in Europe in five, six countries, there's so many commonalities there now. Yes, the culture is different, but the work environment, the laws, the coordination between the European Union create more similarities. If you really want to see differences, you need to have the comparative differences between working in some place like the UK and China, or Brazil and the United States, um, India and Australia. Those are the more extreme differences in work environment. And when people have had those type of experiences, they're in a much better position with more validity to comment. Top five reasons to do nothing. Number two, if ISA was voluntary, I volunteer to ignore. Well, that's okay, but the organizations you work for or are governed by or interface with, they may choose not to ignore ISO standards. Imagine working in the environmental sector and choosing to ignore ISO 14000. ISO or any standard is not a be-all to end-all. Make no mistake, we're not trying to sell standards as some ubiquitous cure for making things better. All we're saying is standards have a role and they have the potential to add value. So if you know someone, you know, if you still challenge this assertion, if you know someone working in the environmental sector, just ask them, yes, ISO 14000 is voluntary, but did it have an impact on their job, on their organization, on their career? I'm pretty sure they're going to tell you it had a pretty big impact. And the number one reason for not participating, it's a vote against the project. So if I don't participate, the message that I'm sending is I don't support this project. Well, you know what? Not participating is a vote in favor of the consensus formed by those who do participate. Think of the Olympic boycotts. Did boycotting the Olympics actually achieve its end objective? The Olympics still happen? Yes, they did. Or was it more like a trade war where both sides lose? In trade theory, that is the end game of a trade war, is both sides lose. Let's face it, this HR standards project is underway. As I've mentioned before, it's not a theory. We're entering the second year of ISO TC260. There will be ISO standards in human resources. Again, it's not a theory, it's not speculation. By boycotting, the end result is it's the best way to guarantee that other countries are the ones that get to decide what terms and conditions are included in HR's version of the Olympics. Okay, next category, top five mis misconceptions that we come across. Number five, SHRM is trying to impose US HR standards on the world. Number four, HR is overstepping its territory, for example, uh, territory by the ILO. Number three, ISO, isn't that uh, a European thing? Number two, standards in HR are regressive. They move the benchmark to the lowest common denominator. And number one, national regional standards need to be developed first before ISO standards. So that's the top five list of misconceptions. Let's go through them one by one. Number five, SHRM is trying to impose US HR standards. Um, the ISO process has one country, one vote. That's how it works. SHRM, as the partner with ANSI in the United States, has one vote. Another country with its corresponding standards body has one vote. Uh, it's pretty hard to make the case that there's the opportunity or the position for SHRM to impose U.S. standards when you've got a democratic process based on one country, one vote. And I have to say there's a profound irony when so much discussion surrounding HR and strategy and decision making talks about getting a seat at the table. This is HR's table, and if HR people are choosing not to take a seat at their own table, 
that really brings into question their seriousness and or dedication when it comes to what is supposedly their profession. No seat, no input into the priorities. And as we'll go through in part three of this series, I encourage you to read an established standard. The ANSI standards, there's a few of them into the marketplace. There'll be several more by the end of the year. When we go through part three of this series, I want you to ask yourself, is the standard on performance management too American or too SHRM? I think you know my opinion on that already, but I want you to see it for yourself. If, in fact, you feel it is too biased towards any nation, get involved to fix it or change it or eliminate it. Number four of top five misconceptions. This project is moving into another entity's turf, for example, the ILO, the International Labour Organization. Um, what needs to be said here is that the ILO covers the minimum global workforce standards. That is their domain, and no one argues with that. But remember, we're talking about minimum effective standards. And that's what we're talking about as it relates specific to HR. One of the best ways to make the difference is think about the difference between a minimum wage relative to a living wage. A living wage is a concept that is in many parts of the world right now being discussed in terms of a social policy. The minimum wage in countries that have a minimum wage is set by law, and that is the domain of the ILO. When you start talking about things like a living wage, that's when you're moving into the discussion about HR and the appropriate role of human resources in the community as it relates to something like a living wage. So do review. If you still have concerns about this, go to the ILO website and see just what is their mission, what type of projects, what types of interventions they're involved with. One thing to note that I think is incredibly important as it relates to this project when the ISO standards project for HR was first introduced, the ILO was one of the most concerned parties about where this process was going. As of this year, their position on the project now is to become an observer to the project itself, which is a very, very different standing than the ILO had when the project was first introduced. Number three in top five misconceptions about the ISO standards project. ISO, isn't that a, a European thing? Well, I guess uh, so is soccer or football, or is that football and soccer? Uh, my point is ISO is the UN of all forms of human connectivity. ISO standards are everywhere. They're so ubiquitous that people aren't even aware of all of the influence that the International Standards Organization has in conjunction with national standards bodies. Um, it's everywhere. The technology to watch this webinar is only possible because of ISO standards. Did you get paid lately? You know, did the banks send money from one bank to another? IBAN payment numbers. Those are ISO standards. ISO standards are everywhere. And I encourage you to visit the ISO website to get a true understanding of just how much standards proliferate the environment all over the world. They have videos online that you can watch, including on the SHRM homepage, SHRM.org. If you go to the standards section, there are two videos there that introduce the American National Standards Institute, as well as ISO standards. So that's at SHRM.org under the standards uh, subheading. Top five misconceptions. Number two, standards in HR are regressive. It's a migration to the lowest common denominator. I think a lot of people feel this even if they don't say it. But ask yourself this. Ask yourself and ask others. A large percent of people actually doing HR, and I stress that, people who are actually doing HR in their organizations will tell you, that their organizations are not even doing the basics regularly or consistently. There's an expression, knowing and not doing is not really knowing. Not having standards is, in fact, the make work project because you can make a case for almost anything you do or don't do. Remember my earlier point about having KPIs linked to a turnover number? That the metric someone had decided to just make up on their own. If you doubt my paradox, I challenge you to go into your own organization, 
using one of the new ANSI standards and see, are these very, very basic standards, are they truly regressive? Or perhaps on some levels, they might even be ignored. And number one, the number one misconception that we see is the idea that national standards need to be developed before ISO standards. I, I see this everywhere, and I really want to spend a bit more time on this topic. It's because it's such an important concept to think about. It actually makes more sense to create global, that is, universal standards first, and then do more, then localize, then specialize at home, whatever your home market is. I'll give you an example. Think about minimum wage laws within a country, whatever country you're in right now. Let's pretend that there's no minimum wage laws and you as a country are deciding to introduce these minimum wage laws. What is the best way to go about doing this? Do you actually ask each state, each province, each emirate to develop its minimum wage first and then get together as a group to come up with a single one for the federation? Or does it make more sense to start with a federal discussion, the broadest discussion possible, and then allow the sub-governments to develop their own minimum wage? At a minimum, they should meet or exceed the minimum wage of the country. I hope that example helps make the point that I'm trying to make here. That it, when you're dealing with standards, especially global standards, it's actually more beneficial to approach the project from the universal, from the general, from the global point of view first. Get something that everyone can agree to universally and then go home and do better. Or at a minimum, don't do any worse. In many ways, that's how the ILO process works. I know that politically this is very hard to do because what it involves is an element of trust that other governments, other participants are going to approach the project with goodwill. And make no mistake, in order for projects to move ahead, someone has to do the work first. Someone has to arrive at the discussions having done some work with some suggestions, with some proposals, and also when you're in sort of political situations, whoever plays the first card, that has a strong influence on the negotiation process. I concede all of these points. But my underlying point here is that the smart countries that do get involved in this project will be the ones that focus on the key or most important items to them while ensuring that no standards being introduced at the global scale will be impossible for them at home. I sincerely believe that that is the best strategy, but what I see, and I'm not going to mention any countries by name, but I see this all over the world right now in terms of this project, is kind of a catch-up where countries are saying, oh, if we're going to get involved in this project, what we need to do is develop standards at home first and then bring those standards to the ISO table. I would say to you, no, prioritize what's important to you, develop the global standards, and then go home and do better. In any case, if you're not participating, no seat, no say. The table's there. It's waiting for many countries to join. Top five least valid concerns, the list. Number five, HR should be left to the market. This should be not be something that's uh, negotiated. Number four, HR imperialism, that's the real agenda. Number three, a professional union, that's the real agenda behind this project. Number two, HR standards compromise confidentiality and competitive information. And number one, experience, not standards, experience is what makes someone an expert. So these are the five least valid concerns. Let's go through them one by one. Number five, Leave HR to the market. We hear this a lot. Well, I would agree wholeheartedly, in fact. But what we're talking about here in terms of standards and what history shows in other industries and other professions is that it's actually the market that creates the incentives to create standards 
because the subsequent net benefit will greatly exceed any social or economic costs. I think on a mechanical and a physical level, we get this intuitively. You know, whether it's the assembly line and interchangeable parts, creating standards to build cars, we get that. But for some reason, on the more abstract level, it's much harder for people to buy into. But here's the thing. In terms of standards, when you create the standard, if it's right, if it's market driven, you actually create new markets. Remember the earlier example with the suburbs and the internet and social media. When these original uh, projects were brought together, they really didn't know what would be the next market that they would be creating. That the automobile would create suburbs, that the internet would lead to social media, but in fact they did. And new markets, working more efficiently and effectively, push out those who have actually lower standards. Informally, the charlatans or the snake oil salespeople get pushed out of a market that's working more efficiently. And standards can help that. Top five least valid concerns. Well, some people will say that this is a goal by HR to be more imperialistic. What do I mean by that? Well, the project is a further attempt by HR to consolidate power in organizations based upon being a gatekeeper to even more rules and regulations. We hear this. People say this. We believe this is a least valid concern. Because in contrast, what's happening when you develop these types of standards is HR is more objectively accountable to even more stakeholders, including themselves. You think about it. It's the hoarding of information that creates power through being the gatekeeper of rules and regulations. But standards just just the opposite. Standards is a facilitator of greater transparency. So that's why we feel that this is an invalid concern. Number three, ulterior motives, rent-seeking professionals. One of the arguments that may is made that this project is really designed to create a union of HR professionals. Well, let's be fair. I believe that more productive and value-added work in any field should be compensated with a premium. Standards will help HR practitioners prove their worth. Hopefully that is something that you agree to. But this project has nothing to do with licensing or regulating or unionizing the supply of HR practitioners. Uh, there's nothing that relates to that in this project. So full disclosure. Top five least valid concerns. Number two, HR standards can compromise the confidentiality of competitive information. This is one I only heard quite recently. And again, I absorb it, I take it in, I digest it, and I, I could not disagree more. For one, HR standards, it's completely voluntary. Everything that we're talking about, that hasn't been clear to you before, ISO standards are voluntary. No organization, no HR practitioner must implement this. It is not a legal requirement anywhere in the world. Using HR standards also doesn't mean that you have to report your standards. Right now there's ANSI standards, cost per hire. You could take that standard and use it in your organization right now wherever you are in the world. You don't have to report that information. It's internal information. The value to you is the fact that you know that the standard that you're using is vetted from the community. And if you choose to compare your metrics to another organization using the same standard, you can make a comparison. But think about this. Imagine finance before it created its standards and someone was proposing to make public, well, debt to equity ratio or profit to loss. Imagine those, you know, all, we've never had to report those numbers before and now you're telling us that we have to report our debt to equity ratio, our profit and loss. And yet finance still moved ahead with developing these metrics and analytics as part of their standards base. Clearly, those measures have much more competitive value than what we're talking about in human resources. What we're trying to say is that standards can level a playing field where it should be leveled, which in turn allows for even greater levels of healthy competition. And we believe that st the standards in finance demonstrate the net trade-off that when you create more transparent metrics that you all agree to, 
that the application has a win-win benefit for all of those who choose to use the standard. And number one, in terms of least valid concerns, experience makes an expert. Well, you know what? Standards hold professionals accountable. Imagine if every medical doctor who learned their trade through independent trial and error without sharing their experience, without building a knowledge base for future generations. Imagine if that happened. Standards in HR, and I don't think this gets appreciated enough, it's just as much about building a base of knowledge management as it is in creating efficiencies that facilitate effectiveness. On the job training, it should be done in parallel with a professional establishment, not a guild of artisans. Five most valid concerns. We're kind of going in a different direction now. All of the previous we've listed, basically what we're saying is we hear you, but we disagree. Number five, development time is too long. That's valid. Number four, outdated standards are outdated by the time of the release some validity to that. Number three, there's too many rules in compliance already. Some validity to that. Two, can standards be valid without global diversity? And number one, in terms of valid concerns, is a concept called irrational exuberance. We'll get into that a bit more. Number five, standard development time is too long. Agreed. But let's face it, there's a learning curve for anything that you do and for the participants. The ANSI performance management standard did take three years from start to finish, but now the standards development process for ANSI is trending about 18 months, one and a half years. Involvement is in the process is the learning curve. It is the only way to speed it up. The doing is the training to do it even better. So yes, this is a valid concern. We know this, but it's participating that improves it. Number four, standards are outdated by the time of release. Well, you know, standards are not meant to be lead indicators. Standards are not competencies. Competencies are lead indicators. And a genuine enduring standard emerges from, as we mentioned earlier, market conditions. It takes time for universal standards to emerge. Think of wine and cheese. There is a natural winnowing out process. If an issue is purposefully being accelerated to become a standard, Chances are it represents a personal, personal or social agenda that is better dealt with in a different form, either legally or by convention. Number three, there's too many rules and compliance already. Think about this. If time is money, HR is actually more wasteful now because it keeps relearning and reworking the same measures without standardization. Compliance is more questionable because it's subject to more subjective interpretation. I mentioned my earlier internal HR audit. What is most wasteful is when systems, whether they're tangible or intangible, that can and should use interchangeable parts, don't. That is wasteful. Number two, can standards be valid without global diversity? Well, the answer to that is yes, because they're being developed through a process that is both democratic and uses a globally accepted form, that is ISO. But to be totally clear, they would lack the organic buy-in that they should have, given that the targeted stakeholders are worldwide. The solution? More education about this project, more discussion, more transparency, and those who believe in the project need to take a more active role. This is not the time for passengers in this project. And last but not least, the number one most valid concern is rational exuberance. And we make a correlation here to the Kyoto Accord. Remember we talked earlier about backfill? Backfill must be the primary mandate of the first ISO HR Accord. What is our point of comparison? Think about the Kyoto Environmental Accord. What was the intention of that accord? What was the outcome of that accord? Currently, TC260 has 14 participating nations, only two of which are categorized as emerging markets. There is a genuine danger in this process that the devel developed nations will group think together to create something similar to an HR version of a Kyoto, Kyoto Accord. What this means is that more emerging markets need to participate in this. And the developed nations need to 
step back and be a bit more altruistic when it comes to choosing between a jump or backfill strategy. Top five net benefits. Number five, genuine and contemporary professional apprenticeship. Number four, more focused HR. Number three, CSR, corporate social responsibility. Number two, expert opinion is less individually based. And number one, HR is more credible. These are the net benefits. Number five, a true professional apprenticeship, a profession by the profession for the profession. Knowledge management, we talked about this earlier. The principles are being applied to the profession itself. That's part of what we're doing here. Apprenticeships become less subjective and more geared towards the contemporary learner. Accelerating their learning curve, they become more competent in HR sooner. I think about my own first HR job 15 years ago, and I was given a form to fill out to become an employee, and I had never seen that form in my entire academic training. That has to stop. I have a feeling that that is still an all too common story around the world today. Number four in terms of benefit, it allows, HR standards allow HR to become more focused, that is more efficient and more effective. Even the best HR teams in the world are wasting time at this very moment reinventing the wheel. New employees, team turnover, no, new leadership, HR is swaying in, in the winds of change. Developing and using standards actually allows less time and energy to be spent on the basics, which allows more time and energy to be de dedicated to doing more, to adding more value to the organization. Plus, it helps HR with more support when it needs to stand up for what is right. If you're put in a compromising position as HR and you can point to, to your organization, your boss, your leadership, your peers, and say, this isn't my opinion. If we want to be in compliance with the ISO standard for HR, we need to do this. That is extremely helpful. And I don't think developed nations appreciate how valuable that would be in emerging markets where HR is still developing. Number three, corporate social responsibility. As a net benefit, precisely because of how these standards are developed, it gives the metrics and analytics related to social responsibility, even more credibility. And as a group, if HR wants to be taken more seriously, we need to move away from this moral suasion argument and deal with more objective facts. HR will never become a cold physical science, but it really does help our softer and valid agenda if we can be more objective in our rationale. Number two, HR is no longer one expert's opinion. Being able to more objectively represent on behalf of your professional community empowers you as an individual HR practitioner. It provides you with a base of credibility from which to stand upon. Subject matter experts, these should be commonplace, not islands. I look at my own experience with metrics and I, I come to realize in doing this project that part of the reason I've become jaded to certain aspects of metrics is I see the flaws in the system. Doing this project, creating standards, is exciting to me because I see a return to something that I consider extremely important, and that is creating a base of knowledge that all of a sudden is portable and has enduring value. And number one, and this was the point of, of the first webinar, cre creating more credibility, more professional credibility for HR itself. Standards in HR will instill more constructive di discipline to HR, which gives HR more credibility, which attracts more capable people to work in HR, which makes HR more enticing as a profession to work in, giving the profession more credibility. I'm not going to go into it in much more detail. This entire slide is part one of this series. And part three of this series talks about the power of a positive feedback loop. Values versus principles. We're back to the beginning when we talked about global diversity. Global diversity is one of humanity's greatest strengths, but it also contains an intellectual illusion. An intellectual illusion. On the one hand, a contradiction to those who choose to perceive global diversity as a contradiction. And on the other hand, it's a strength for those who choose to perceive global diversity uh, as that way. In HR, Globally, if we choose to internalize and value global diversity as a strength, we will all benefit. 
This is a quote that came to me quite recently. Um, Stephen Covey, I would hope most of you would be familiar with him. Unfortunately, he's recently passed. He said, values are eternal and principles are external. Think about that. Values are internal and principles are external. To date, HR has been pushing its values into the market, somewhat like pushing a string. And as a result, we get frustrated. What we need to do is clearly articulate our principles so that those principles in turn pull our values into the marketplace. And that is one of the major reasons for this HR standard project and why global diversity is central to its success. Values are internal, principles are external. That concludes part two. I thank you once again for your attention. You have my contact information at the bottom of this slide. I'd be happy to take any questions that you have at this time now. Thank you very much, Mr. Brad. It was a really interesting uh, webinar, and you you shared with us you know so many information related to you know the, the main reasons for having the HR standards, and at the same time the other uh, you know invalid reasons that people are thinking about having these HR standards.